Thank you very much. Uh, so first, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to speak here. It's a great pleasure. And as my title uh, suggests, I'm going to talk about two uh, conjectures, which at least a priori uh, seem somewhat unrelated. So the first one is a famous conjecture, eight years old open conjecture from convex geometry, known as Muller's conjecture. And it concerns the relation between the volume of the convex body and the volume of its dual body or polar body. And uh, the second conjecture is a systolic type uh, inequality, which was conjectured by Viterbo in the context of uh, symplectic measurements or symplectic capacities. And what I would like to do in this talk is to explain the uh, relation between these two conjectures, and if time permits, uh, to describe some new uh, results, some new progress. So let me start with Mahler's conjecture. So Kurt Mahler, um, German-born mathematician, uh, which as far as I know has no relation with the famous composer. <laughs> and he is known uh, mostly for his works in number theory. And in particular, he has uh, several results in what is called the geometry of numbers, which is roughly speaking uh, the relation between the existence of certain integer vectors and volume of convex bodies in n-dimensional space. And uh, in particular, uh, motivated by concrete applications to number theory, Mahler was interested in the relation between the volume of a convex body and the volume of its reciprocal body or its dual body. So here is the definition of a dual body of a given convex set in Rn. But you can ignore the definition and just, if you more intuitively kind of way to think about it, if you think about the convex body, say, as the unit norm of a certain, as a unit ball, sorry, of a certain normed space, in this picture you see the unit ball of the L infinity norm, then the dual body would be just the unit ball of the dual space equipped with the dual norm, so the L1 norm. Uh, formally speaking, the dual body should live in the dual space, but let me ignore this uh, technical point for a second. So more precisely, uh, if X is an n-dimensional normed space, I'm going to denote its unit ball by B of X. <coughs> so this is a centrally symmetric uh, convex body. And I will denote by Bx star the unit ball of the dual space. And uh, Mahler introduced the following <laughs> quantity, just the volume product of these two unit balls. It is known as the Mahler's volume or the volume product. And uh, this quantity, well, note that it has no dimension, so it's homogeneous of degree zero, it has no units. Oh, thank you. That's, that's, a good, um, that's a good question. What is the definition of volume? Well, the nice way to do it is to look at the product of V times V star. And this, uh, sorry, I, I used X in my slides, but the vector space times the dual vector space, then this configuration has a natural symplectic structure, which I will define in a second. And hence, it has a nice, uh, a, a natural definition of volume. But Mahler probably didn't think about kind of this, uh, this setting, at least originally. So that was your new of X, uh, <coughs> just taking that volume. Right, right, of the product of Bx and Bx star. Yes, just the volume of the product of these two convex domains. Yes. And what I would like to emphasize is that this quantity, uh, in some sense, captures the roundness of the convex body, or equivalently of the, of the normed space. And uh, to support this statement, I want to uh, state a famous inequality. It is known as the blaschka santalo inequality. And uh, it states that nu x is maximized precisely for Euclidean structures. So if and only if the unit ball is an ellipsoid. Uh, this was proved by Blaschke in, I think, 1920s for the two-dimensional case and probably also the three-dimensional case. And the general proof was given by Santalo in the 1950s. 
so from that uh, point of view, nu of x captures some roundness of the convex body. So the one extremizer is the ball or an ellipsoid. And Mahler's question, roughly speaking, is what is the other extreme of this inequality? So what is the least round, or if you like, the most pointed centrally symmetric convex body in Rn? And the conjecture is that nu of x is bounded below by 4 to the n over n factorial, which is exactly the volume product of the cube. So cube should be the least round convex body in the class of centrally symmetric convex domains in the n space. Okay, so that's Mahler's conjecture. <coughs> and Mahler gave a proof uh, for n equals 2 in the plane in 1939. And it's been 80 years going from n equals 2 to n equals 3. So very recently uh, it was announced by Irie and Shibata that uh, Mahler's conjecture also holds for uh, dimension three. And I should say that the reason that it's been, uh, s there, there is this eight years gap between n equals two and e n equals three is not because uh, this conjecture was somewhat forgotten. In fact, throughout the years, many people try to attack uh, Mahler's conjecture and it would be impossible for me to do a real justice to the history of the conjecture. I cannot mention all the, all the partial result in this direction. <coughs> right, it will appear probably oh, on, on, on my, next, uh, my next slide. So there are many partial results about uh, Mahler's conjecture and I want to mention one of them. Uh, this is a theorem by Bourgain and Milman where they uh, gave a proof of the conjecture asymptotically. So asymptotically in, in the dimension, the conjecture holds up to a constant. There is a universal constant such that one has uh, this inequality. So of course the conjecture that C should be one. And uh, the state of the art result, as far as I know, for uh, the numerical value of C is pi over four. So this was proved by Cooperberg in uh, <laughs> 2008. Right, right, right. Okay, mm -hmm. it's the same order of magnitude. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So why um, why this conjecture is so difficult? So if you think about sim uh, you can think for example about the Blaschke Santaloy inequality, the other side of of this inequality. So usually with such extremal problems in convex geometry, uh, there are kind of a, a common strategy to, uh, to tackle this question is via certain optimization procedure or symmetrization procedure. And uh, the blaschke santaloy inequality can be solved, for example, by using Steiner symmetrization, kind of a classical uh, symmetrization in, in convex geometry. But uh, the problem with uh, Mahler's conjecture is that, at least conjecturally, the minimizer is actually not unique. So there is a large class of, bod of convex bodies. Uh, they have a name, the hunter lima polytops. And you can think about them, you know, you start with a line segment and you start to apply um, Cartesian products and dual operators, construct new bodies. And all these polytops are known to have the same uh, volume product, the same Mahler's volume as the cube, right? So you mentioned uh, Terry Tao, so let me quote uh, this sentence from his blog on Mahler's conjecture. And the, the, the quotation states that it is somehow hard to imagine an optimization procedure that would end up exactly in this particular class of convex bodies. So it's not clear how uh, to apply optimization techniques to, to Mahler's conjecture. And, um, Terry Tao uh, kind of writes that a di different type of argument might be needed to tackle this question. And this brings me to the first point, uh, the main kind of first main point in my talk. And I would like to try to convince you that the variety of this family of minimizers is actually an optical illusion. 
And to understand why they, this is an optical illusion, well, you have to put on your symplectic glasses. So this is what I would like to do next. I want to leave Muller conjecture aside for a while, move to symplectic geometry, and then go back and explain the relation to, to Muller's conjecture. Any questions up to this point? Yes, uh, thank you. So yes, let, let me go back uh, for a second. So yes, so when I introduce the Muller volume, I, it's a func I mean, it's a functional associated with the norm space itself. And the, the, there is an analog of the same quantity for non-symmetric convex bodies, but, when, uh, but then when one takes the, the dual convex body, you have a little bit to be careful where the origin, I mean, the duality should be with respect to a certain, to a certain point. But yes, there, there is an analog of, uh, of Mahler's conjecture also for non-symmetric uh, convex domains, but in this talk I'm going to focus only on uh, unit balls of normed spaces, or in other words, on centrally symmetric convex domains in, in RN. Yes. <coughs> okay. Okay, so let me move, uh, move to uh, symplectic geometry. So in symplectic geometry, we study a uh, smooth manifold equipped with a two form, which should be closed and non-degenerate, the symplectic form. And uh, this structure uh, appears very naturally in Hamiltonian dynamics. Symplectic manifolds originally um, appeared in the context of um, Hamiltonian dynamics, and they serve as a natural geometric framework to discuss uh, say Newton equations of, of motion. And it is known that the physical motion in phase space respects the symplectic structure. So it preserves the symplectic form. And uh, an important feature of uh, symplectic transformation, and this is in a sharp contrast with say Riemannian structure, is that we have a lot of symmetries in the symplectic world. So the group of symmetries of the symplectic form is an infinite <coughs> dimensional Lee group. And another uh, sharp contrast with Riemannian geometry is that we cannot distinguish between two symplectic manifolds of the same dimension locally. So locally, all the symplectic manifolds looks like um, the standard R2n equipped with the standard symplectic form. So there are no uh, local invariants in, in symplectic geometry. And historically, uh, this fact caused some stagnation in the, in the field of symplectic geometry. And I think that only around the 1960s, starting with certain conjectures by Arnold, uh, people started to realize or to suspect that uh, symplectic transformation might behave very differently than volume preserving transformations. And I guess the most striking example of this difference is given by this famous result of Gromov, known as the non-squeezing result. And it states that if you take an Euclidean ball, <coughs> B, in R2n with radius capital R, and throughout the talk I'm going to denote uh, by Z uh, a cylinder, which is based on a two-dimensional disk of radius small r, then uh, if we try to symplectically embed the ball inside the cylinder, <coughs> excuse me, then Gromov tells us that this is in fact impossible. So the only way you can do it is if the radius of the cylinder, if the radius of the ball, sorry, is already less than or equal to the radius of the cylinder. So in a sharp contrast with volume preserving transformation, where of course you can squeeze an arbitrary large ball into such a cylinder. In the symplectic uh, world, there are certain, I would say, mysterious obstructions which prevent such an embedding. So that's the non-squeezing uh, result. And from this theorem, one can actually cook some global invariants or measurements in, in the context of symplectic geometry. They are called uh, nowadays symplectic capacities. 
So to keep the presentation simple, I'm going to focus only on the classical phase space. I'm only going to consider R2n, the symplectic manifold R2n, equipped with the standard symplectic form. This is the classical phase space in Hamiltonian mechanics. And the way we perform measurements in the symplectic uh, world is via of a symplectic capacity. So what is a symplectic capacity? Well, it's a map which, roughly speaking, associates or measures the symplectic size of a set. So we want it to be a monotone. That's the first requirement. And then the second requirement is that we want it to uh, behave <laughs> nicely with respect to scaling of the symplectic form. So in particular, it should be a symplectic invariant. And the most interesting point is the third property. So remember that Z and B are the ball and the cylinder from the non-squeezing theorem. So the third requirement is that the ball and the cylinder should have the same size. So this is a definition of what a symplectic capacity is. And a few remarks. So first, uh, note that this quantity scales like a two-dimensional invariant. So the, it has units of area. This is what we measure. And uh, the second observation it, uh, is that it has nothing to do with volume. Right? I mean, the fact that the cylinder has a finite size immediately tells us that it, this quantity has nothing to do with volume whatsoever. And my third remark, this is essentially an exercise, is to check that the existence of any such a single capacity is actually equivalent to Gromov's non-squeezing theorem. So at least a priori, it is completely unclear how to cook up such, such invariants. So let's see uh, two examples, kind of important example. The first one is the Gromov width. So how do we measure the size of a set? Well, we ask ourselves, what is the largest ball that we can symplectically embed inside the set? Okay, so that's the Gromov width. And the cylindrical capacity is the opposite question. So given a set, we want to find the smallest cylinder such that we can embed our set inside the cylinder. And it follows from the non-squeezing theorem that these two quantities are indeed symplectic capacities. Okay, it's not completely clear. And they are going to play an important role later on because, again, it follows from the definition that every normalized symplectic capacity is actually uh, lies in between these two capa capacities. So this is the smallest possible and the largest possible symplectic capacities. OK, so these are two examples which are closely related with symplectic embedding questions. What about other examples? And if you look at the last 30 years in symplectic geometry, there have been several kind of breakthroughs in the field, and several technologies were introduced to the field. Now, I'm not going to talk much about it, but let me just <coughs> mention uh, Gromov's theory of pseudo-holomorphic curves, which somehow is behind the, the fact, the non-squeezing result, and the fact that these are symplectic capacities. There is Fleur homology, which is some infinite dimensional version of uh, Morse theory, and symplectic field theory, and several other um, techniques that have been introduced to symplectic geometry. And roughly speaking, with each such new development, or with each such new technology, there come a new way to measure the symplectic size of a set. Right? So this is a very partial list of known symplectic capacities. So we saw the Gromov width, which is based on the theory of pseudo-holomorphic curves. And a couple of years later, Hofer and Sender introduce a uh, symplectic capacity which is uh, closely related to properties and to <coughs> the existence and properties of periodic orbits in Hamiltonian dynamical system. And then there are capacities which are based on Fleur homology, symplectic homology, and so on and so forth. So every couple of years, new, technolo new technology is developed 
And with this new technology, usually in many cases, come a new way to measure the symplectic size of a set. And again, I want to emphasize that the mere existence of these capacities already um, has some non-trivial applications to symplectic geometry. But some of these capacities, so for example, the hofford sender capacity has also applications in Hamiltonian dynamics and in, in other fields. So these quantities, these invariants, in some sense, lie at the heart of modern symplectic topology. And we have, so by now, we know many different ways to perform symplectic measurements. But now there is a problem. And the problem is that we don't know how to compute these capacities. So all this long list of symplectic invariants, choose your favorites, and let me kind of pose a provocative question. And what is the symplectic size of a cube? Right? So let's go back, you know, choose one of these capacities, the hofford sender capacity, the gom of width, whatever, your favorite, and take the cube in Rm and tell me what is the symplectic size of the cube. And unfortunately, the short answer to this question is that nobody knows. Right? We don't really know what is the symplectic size of a cube. OK, but let me be careful. I wrote a cube and not the cube. So usually people think about the cube, right? So minus one, one to the power two to the n. So Q is, sorry, let, let me go back. So Q is the cube, the standard cube. And we know what is the symplectic size of the standard cube. Uh, again, it, it doesn't follow immediately. You have to work a little bit. But the symplectic size of the <coughs> standard cube is four with respect to this normalization. But what I'm asking is, you know, take the standard cube and rotate it just a little bit. So now what is the symplectic size of the cube? And really nobody knows. Right. So I can tell you about this particular example, what we do know. And uh, before that, I should emphasize that if you just think about volume obstructions, so we take, for example, the Grom of Wit, the largest ball that we can symplectically embed inside the cube. So the cube has huge volume, right? So if you just look at the obstruction which comes from volume, then the size of the cube, so this uh, fancy less than or equal to means that I don't really care about constants. I just care about the order of magnitude. So volume obstructions only gives us that the size of the cube is less than n, linear in the dimension. Right? That's, that's the only thing that we can get from volume. Okay. And um, what we know about the cube is that, and this is an asymptotic statement, is that there exists a certain position, a certain rotation. So if you like, this is, this is exactly what I mean by a cube, right? kind of a rotation of the standard cube. So we know that there exists a very specific rotation which gives us uh, the order of square root of n. And I should say that this is in fact optimal. I mean, you cannot go uh, above square root n even though the volume obstruction is, is just n. So this is asymptotically sharp. Uh, asymptotically sharp. This is kind of the best thing that asymptotically you can get. Okay, but still, this is for a very specific cube, okay, a very specific rotation. And we want to know something about the general or kind of whatever it means, a general cube. And for some capacities, for example, the hofford sender capacity that I mentioned before, we can do slightly better. We can actually compute what is the size of a randomly rotated cube. So we can compute the expectation of uh, a rotation of the cube with respect to the Haar measure. And we get this strange quantity, square root of n over log n. And in fact, using some standard technique from concentration of measure, we can show that not only that this is the expectation, the deviation from the expectation is exponentially small. So really, the symplectic size, say the hofford sender uh, capacity size of a cube, of a random cube, 
is uh, square root of n over log n. And it's not completely clear what is the geometric meaning of this quantity, right? Why this particular um, quantity appear here. Can you explain the square root n? Yes. Um, so to get an upper bound which is square root of n, you can do the following thing. So you, you have the rotated cube. You choose one direction, which is the width, kind of the shortest direction. So the projection on this direction is 2, right? And then you look, so if this direction is v, look at i times v. So i in R2n. Now you have no control on the other direction, but it's at most the diameter of the cube, which is square root of n. And then you take this complex line, spanned by these two directions, and just project to this complex line. So this is the way you get the square root of n as an upper bound. It is slightly more tricky to explain how uh, you get square root of n as a lower bound. Okay. Yes, I, I, yeah, I, I should have said that. I'm sorry. Yes, the, this fancy less than or equal to or the fancy equality side means everything is up to constants, which yeah. are universal constant independent on the body or the dimension. Yes. You know the yes. Mm -hmm. mm. Right. Yes. So we can say something for the particular case of the cube, we can say something about the symplectic size. But kind of the point I'm trying to make is that for general convex bodies, we are very far from understanding what it is exactly that we measure when we talk about symplectic measurements. So what is the symplectic size of something? Okay. And in around 2000, uh, Claude Viterbo tried or started to investigate the relation between uh, the symplectic size of, of convex domains and other quantities which are naturally associated with convex domains, like the diameter in radius, and volume, and, and so on and so forth. And he made the following systolic type conjecture. So C here is any symplectic capacity, and K is a convex body. So this conjecture states that among all convex domains in R2n with a given volume, so if we normalize the volume, then the Euclidean ball should have the maximal symplectic size. So this is exactly what this conjecture tells you. Okay. Now, it is not hard to check that for the Grom of width, the special symplectic capacity, just by monotonicity, the conjecture holds. And recall that the Grom of wheat was the smallest possible normalized symplectic capacity. But other than this particular example, for all other known capacities, we do not know whether the conjecture holds. And we, it would be useful later on to write it down in an equivalent form like this because we can just plug in the volume of the two n-dimensional Euclidean ball and the capacity of the Euclidean <coughs> ball and, and we get this inequality. So Viterbo's conjecture is either this inequality or this inequality. They are, of course, equivalent. Okay. So what do we know about this conjecture? Well, we know, again, <laughs> that it holds asymptotically. What does it mean? It means that there exists a universal constant such that this inequality holds. So this is a joint work with Shiri Archstein Vidan and Vitali Milman from Tel Aviv University. We cannot say much about this constant A. So it's less than 1,000. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, so w when I'm saying asymptotically, I mean up to a universal constant which is independent on, on the dimension, and I should scale it to, to have like units one. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if this is kind of a common terminology, but uh, asymptotic version of the inequality just exactly means that we can put a constant here, which is independent on the dimension or on the convex body. And uh, quite recently, uh, Abondandalo, Bramham, Iranovich, and Salomeo proved a local version of uh, Viterbo's conjecture 
in R4. So there exists a certain neighborhood of uh, the Euclidean ball such that the conjecture holds for convex domains inside this neighborhood. So kind of a, a progress towards this direction um, in R4. Did I, Barney, can I ask you if I kind of stated this statement correctly? Okay, yeah, just wanted to make sure. <laughs> okay. So more or less, this is what we currently know about Viterbo's conjecture. And um, I can now come to the main um, theorem of, of this talk. So we have the two heroes of the story. We have uh, Viterbo's conjecture, which I stated here, and uh, Muller's conjecture, which is stated here. Okay, so this is 1939. Th sorry, this one is 1939. This is 2001. Okay. And the main result is that and this is a joint work with Shiri Arshen Avidan and Roman Karasev, is that Mahler's conjecture is actually equivalent to a special case of Viterbo's conjecture. So these conjectures are closely related somehow. And uh, let me explain what do I mean by a special case. So here we have a general convex body in R2n, and here we have two n-dimensional bodies. Uh, symmetric convex body and it's dual, right? So by a special case, I mean where in Viterbo's conjecture, one consider convex domains of this particular form, the product of a, con a centrally symmetric convex domain times its dual. Leave, oh, I, I erased this, but leave the kind of the product leaves naturally in this, in this space. And the main idea of the proof is that there exists a very special symplectic capacity such that the symplectic size of the products of Bx and Bx star <coughs> equals four for any centrally symmetric convex body Bx. Now, if you think about this statement, it goes against everything I said so far. Because usually, we know how to compute volume, and we have no ideas how to compute symplectic <coughs> capacity. So here, this is the only case where we actually know exactly what the symplectic size is, but we don't know what the volume is. So it's kind of a strange example. So here it's the natural symplectic size of the volume. Uh, I'm taking, uh, say, Okay, uh, it, it will be on my s slide in, in, in just, just a second, but, but yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, it, it will appear on, on the next slide. But you can think about, I mean, if you think about, say, Rn and then R2n or, or Cn, you just take the, the standard inner product and the natural symplectic structure would be the imaginary <coughs> part of the Hermitian inner product in, in this space. Okay, so that's the main, uh, the main idea of the proof. And the, I, uh, of course, I, I should explain what is this number four. So this is not a new definition of, of the number four. And uh, this number four here is closely related with Finsler billiard dynamics. So this is what I want to do in the last part of my talk. I want to explain um, what is the, the kind of the idea behind the main idea of the proof. And it is closely related with, with billiard dynamics. And um, but maybe I should s uh, stop here and, s and ask if there are questions up to this point. Well, in fact, there should be a question. <laughs> and I will wait a little bit longer. You, you have to look, look again at this theorem and at these two conjectures, and something should bother you. <laughs> uh, that's also true. I, uh, yes, uh, thank you. So uh, the main idea here is only in one direction, right? So the main idea here explains why um, Viterbo's conjecture imply Mahler's conjecture, right? So if, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, if, if the symplectic size of this quantity is four and you plug it in here, 
you immediately get Mahler's conjecture. But uh, no, in fact, there is something else that should have bothered you, not, not the fact that they are actually equivalent, but something strange. There is something strange about this statement. Okay, so here is a hint. Think, yeah. Um, to some extent, yes, right? So you, you have to ask yourself, what are the extremizers in the above conjectures, right? So I told you that for the Mahler's conjecture, the conjecturally extremizer are this class of Hunter Lima polytopes, right? And for the Viterbos conjecture, the extremizer is the Euclidean ball, right? So something is strange, right? And this is exactly uh, the point I was trying to make before about this optical illusion, right? And the point is that symplectically, they are exactly the same. So what do I mean by that? And this is kind of a fact which is well known for people in symplectic geometry, I'm not sure what is the precise reference for this. I, I learned this from Felix Schlenk, that if you look at the product <laughs> of the L infinity unit ball and the L1 unit ball, then this is the interior of this product is symplectomorphic to the Euclidean unit ball, the two n dimensional Euclidean unit ball of the same dimension. So symplectically speaking, the extremizers are the same. Well, almost, right? There are other extremizers, right? This was only one. But there is a work in progress by uh, Roman Karasev and Felix Schlenk where they are showing, I'm not sure if this was published yet, but they are showing that all the hunter lima polytopes are essentially symplectic, symplectically uh, Euclidean balls. So this suggests at least that it might be uh, useful to try to attack Mahler's conjecture from this particular point of view, because there is one extra, or at least conjecturally, there is one extremizer. Right. So this is kind Do of a... Yes, the product, I'm sorry, the product of the unit ball of the L infinity norm and the L1 norm, the, 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 this configuration lives inside this space. It's the same for the Anna Lima polytope. The and the same, yes, right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's a question. So if I take a Hanner Lima polytope and I take a different polarization of R2N, <coughs> do I get the same Hanner Lima polytope or possibly different? You mean when you step out from the linear category or then? No, I'm not linear. So what do you mean a different polarization of? Um, no, if you, uh, no, it is not clear that you would end up with, uh, with another Hunter Lima polytope. You get something that is, it is simply to a Hunter Lima polytope. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. Okay, so I want to use the last part of my talk to go back and to explain this uh, result that I mentioned before that there exists a symplectic capacity which gives four as the outcome of the question, what is the symplectic size of a convex domain times its dual? And I need to recall some more uh, notations. So this is my R2n. So this is exactly the model that I'm using for, for, this, for this product, equipped with the standard symplectic uh, symplectic form given in local coordinates by dp dq. And I want to take a smooth, uh, compact hypersurface in, in R2n. And it's sometimes convenient to think about this hypersurface as the unit, as the energy surface of a certain Hamiltonian function. So if you prefer Hamiltonian dynamics, you can think about um, the hypersurface as a level set of a certain Hamiltonian function. And then we can restrict the symplectic form to the tangent bundle of the hypersurface. It's going to have a, a kernel, right, which is one dimensional. 
So what we get, we get a canonical line bundle which lives above our hypersurface. And we can look at the integral curves of this line bundle and we get a characteristic foliation. So this is what we see, oops, sorry. I'm too fast, sorry. <coughs> Let me go back. Yes. So this is what we see when we look on the standard sphere. We get exactly the hope vibration on the standard sphere. And from the Hamiltonian point of view, this characteristic foliation is exactly the flow of the Hamiltonian equation associated with this Hamiltonian function. Right. So we have a natural dynamics associated with a hypersurface that lives in R2n equipped with the standard symplectic form. Okay. You have no at this point, I don't need convexity. Now, convexity will, will enter the story only a little bit later. Yes, but here, the only thing that, that I need is the smoothness assumption of my hypersurface and compactness. Okay, so we started with this hypersurface. We associated with it uh, dynamics, and now we can cook some numerical data. So how we are going to do that? We are going to look at periodic orbits or closed characteristics. A priori, it is not clear that they exist, but let's assume for a second that there are periodic orbits. And for a periodic orbit, we can use the symplectic form to measure the area of the disk which is spanned by this periodic orbit. Right? This is exactly what is written here. Right? And we get numerical data, which is called the action spectrum associated with this hypersurface. Again, a priori, this might be empty. Okay. And now convexity enters the story. So up to this point, there was no assumption about convexity, but here is the kind of the upshot of convexity. If you assume, I'm going to abuse notation and say that my hypersurface is convex in the sense that it is the boundary of a convex domain. Okay, so there is a convex, smooth convex domain, and we look at the boundary of this convex domain. This is my hypersurface. And this is a very beautiful result by Hofer and Sander that the minimal element, the minimum element in the action spectrum is a symplectic capacity. And I, I should explain what do I mean by that because, um, okay, it's not, not completely, I'm not completely precise here. So what I mean is that, well, there is a symplectic capacity known as hofer sander capacity which defined in a completely general setting for a symplectic manifold. And the theorem is that if you look at this capacity only on the class of convex domains in R2n, then this capacity coincides with the minimal element in the action spectrum. So this is the actual the, the statement. So the hofer sander capacity is defined in a much more general context. So this is just how we see the hofer sander capacity on this special class of convex smooth hypersurfaces. Um, no, well, capacity, because of monotonicity, is going to be continuous with respect to every topology that you would like to put on, on, on the class of convex domain. So you, you the spectrum? No, you, you don't need to assume three convexity. Yes. Uh, we will talk about, uh, I mean, to some extent you can drop, I mean, the, the important point is convexity. You can drop smoothness, actually. But, okay, uh, I, I will say something about the, the non-smooth case uh, later on. And I should emphasize that what is completely non-trivial here, so remember capacity had three properties. The ball and the cylinder should have the same size. This is usually the most difficult part, but here it's easy because you, you can write down, I mean, the equation of motion for the ball and the cylinder are very simple. You, you see what happens for the ball here, and the cylinder is actually also quite simple, and they have the same size. It's also symplectic invariant because everything is symplectic invariant. What is completely unclear is monotonicity, right? You have one hypersurface inside another hypersurface. You have the dynamics here, the dynamics there. It's completely unclear why the shortest orbit or the shortest periodic orbit in the smaller body should have less uh, action than the, uh, the other one, right? So monotonicity is completely not clear uh, in this theorem. And for this particular capacity, for the hofer sander capacity on the class of convex domain, we can prove that the minimal action among closed characteristics on the boundary 
of the product of a convex body times its dual body is four. So this is the precise statement from before, so for this particular capacity. And note, uh, this is related to your question from before, this is not a smooth hypersurface, right? There are corners. And I'm going to completely ignore this technical issue. So you, you have to, to I mean, it's, it's not a trivial technical issue. As soon as your hypersurface is not smooth, the dynamics a priori is not even well defined. But there, there are some ways, as long as you keep the convexity assumptions, that there are some kind of standard ways to make everything, to make everything work. So the, the crucial point is, is convexity. And one can relax the smoothness. Yes, but this was actually known, I think, uh, before even this statement. So I think the original proof is by Rabinovich yeah, or I mean Weinstein. The Weinstein showed it for convex. And then, then right. at the same time, so Rabinovich showed it for, for right. star shape. Right, right. The 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 yeah, the there is always at least one close characteristic. Yes. So it's 78. Right, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so now I'm going to explain the relation between this and Finsler billiard dynamics. So here is what we have to do. We have to take this configuration to look at this line bundle, or if you like, at the corresponding Hamiltonian equation, <coughs> and to look for uh, closed characteristics. And the geometric intuition that you have to keep in mind is that you should think about this as the unit cotangent bundle. So you have a domain, which later on is going to play the role of a billiard table, <laughs> right, in the configuration space. And then you have another convex body, which is going to control the geometry. So this is what we see in the fiber in the unit uh, cotangent bundle, right. So this is uh, going to be helpful in understanding what I'm going to say next, just to, to think about this configuration really as the unit sphere bundle above Bx, where this is, these are the fibers. And the unit y is, it's independent of the equation Ax, which goes for the other parameter. Is it obvious? Uh, up to a change of, um, of um, rescaling, yes. So if you choose a different, I'm not sure if this was your question, but if you choose a different Hamiltonian function, this would just rescale the, the dynamics. But in terms of uh, periodic the orbits and the action, the would be the same. Yes, it's just a rescaling of the flow. Yes. Um, yes. Okay. Okay, so I want to understand how the Hamiltonian dynamics on the boundary of this product looks like. And now I would like to ask you to ignore these formulas <laughs> and just look at the picture. So what, what I wrote down here is the Hamiltonian vector field that you can write down precisely in coordinates for a very precise Hamiltonian function which has this product has, sorry, which has the boundary of this product has its uh, zero or one level set. Okay. So these are Okay, this is just a precise computation, but you should concentrate on this picture. Right. So we have the product, this picture lives in the phase space. This is a convex body that lives in the configuration space, right? And we think about this as the fiber, okay? So when we follow the Hamiltonian dynamics, we see the following behavior. So Okay, a, genera a, a generic point on the boundary would be, uh, on, say, on the boundary here and in the interior here, for example. So to follow the Hamiltonian dynamics, what we have to do, we have to look at the outer normal at this point and then start to go in the configuration space in exactly this direction till we hit the boundary. Now, at the products of the two boundaries, there is some terrible things that happen due to the effect that this is not smooth. And here I'm kind of hiding all the, the technical details. I'm not telling you exactly what is going on at the products. But if you imagine for a second that you're going to step out of the singular strata, then the next thing that you're going to see is a motion on the other side 
in the direction of the inner uh, normal, so minus this direction here. Okay, so first we move here till we hit the boundary. We look at the outer normal and going in minus the direction. There is a minus direction here because it's a symplectic vector field. Okay, so we go in minus this direction. Again, till we hit the boundary. Here, we should again take the outer normal. It doesn't really look like an outer normal, right? But it should be, it should be an outer normal, I apologize. And you go in this direction till you hit the boundary and you take the outer normal and go in minus this direction and so on and so forth. Right. So you start to see the relation with billiard dynamics, right? The motion, when, when you project everything to the configuration space, you get a billiard-like dynamical system inside BX. Right. But this is not Euclidean billiards. These are, this is an example of a Finsler or Minkowski billiards. So it's a billiard in a, the physical model is a billiard in homogeneous, um, homogeneous and anisotropic medium. So think about liquid crystals. So there is a preferred direction if you shoot a, a beam of light in a liquid crystal, there's going to be a preferred direction. It's not isotropic medium. So here we play billiard, but the geometry is not the Euclidean geometry. It's the geometry which actually comes from the convex body itself. And this is an important point because we have a convex body. Usually we play billiard in a convex body, but now the convex body plays the role of the billiard table and it also controls the geometry with respect to which we play the billiard dynamics. Right? So it is not true that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection here. But what is true is that this trajectory is a, a local extremizer of the length with respect to this norm, the norm which comes <coughs> from this, from the other body. So this result, uh, we wrote it down, but this was definitely known for experts in symplectic geometry, that um, the minimal action among um, periodic, uh, among closed characteristics on the boundary of this configuration. So again, if you think about the relation between geodesics and closed characteristics in a unit cotangent bundle, which is kind of well known, well, the lengths of the geodesics, uh, closed geodesics, correspond to the symplectic action of the closed characteristics in the phase space. And the same thing is going on here. Instead of geodesics, we have billiard orbits. And the lengths of these billiard orbits is now measured with respect to a geometry which comes from this body. And there is a correspondence between the lengths of the trajectories here in the configuration space and the symplectic action of the corresponding closed characteristics in the phase space. It should be the same. This is exactly what happens for <coughs> uh, geodesics on, on Riemannian manifolds. So the Hofford center capacity in this case measures the minimal action among closed characteristics and it translates to the minimal lengths among periodic billiard trajectories here. Okay, but not usual billiard trajectories, but this BX star billiard trajectories. Okay. And the main point is that the shortest billiard trajectory is actually a two, period, two periodic trajectory. It's the trajectory that goes from minus Q to Q. So is this, so I should say that this is not a trivial observation, it is a priori not clear, it is not true in general that the shortest billiard trajectory is a two bouncing orbit, right? There is something very special about, about this configuration. And if you look at this theorem, you sh uh, well, if you look at the picture at least, you should ask me some question about the picture. Yeah, <laughs> right, it doesn't really look like the, the shortest <laughs> periodic billiard trajectory, right? Kind of strange that I decided to, <laughs> so this, this is not by mistake, this is actually <laughs> in contrast with the outer normal from the previous slide, I actually intended to draw this particular um, diameter. It's the, the length you measure. Exactly, that's, that's the point, right, right. So the way we measure the length 
is with respect to the body itself. So it's the dual because we live in the cotangent space instead of the tangent space, but we really measure the lengths with respect to the body. So the distance from the origin to here is one, right? So Q can be any point on the boundary, it doesn't really matter. So the, the minimizers come in this one parameter family of orbits. This is a very kind of special feature of billiard dynamics. It is not that, that the minimizer is a two orbit and it comes in a one, one parameter family. So this explains the four, right? Because one, two, three, four. So that's, that's the definition of the number four. And from here, assuming Viterbo's conjecture, we immediately get to um, Mahler's conjecture. So I'm not sure how much time, do I have like a couple of more minutes, uh, Mark? Uh, <laughs> yes, Mark. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so uh, I want to maybe add one more comment about kind of, okay, so we know that these uh, conjectures are equivalent, so now suppose we want to, instead of attacking directly Mahler's conjecture, let's try to attack Viterbo's conjecture, right? So what we have to do, we have to look at the convex body, find the uh, minimal trajectory, minimal close characteristic, and compare its symplectic, associate symplectic area with the volume of the convex body. It's completely unclear a priori how you are going to do that. And very recently, um, a student of mine, uh, Pazit uh, Chaim Kislev, observed the following thing. So if you start with a polytop, a convex polytop, right? And well, it roughly looks like this. So there are some outer normals here and there are some heights. I'm assuming that the origin is somewhere inside the body. And you ask, in this particular case, what can you say about the minimal closed characteristic? Can you say something about the minimal closed characteristic only for polytops? For example, for simplices in R4, can you find it, right? And one problem with considering polytop is that at least a priori, the minimizer that we are looking for might live in the singular strata, right? So what do I mean by that? Well, we have the facets which are one dimensional but then there is the entire singular strata. So it might be that the orbit that we are interested in lives somewhere in the singular strata of the polytop. And that's going to be problem, a problem if we try to say something about, about this orbit. And what Pazit noticed is that actually there is always going to be a minimizer which visits each facet of the polytop only once, and in particular, there might be some minimizers in the singular strata. We are not ruling out this possibility, but the result is that there is always a genuine, if you like, closed characteristic, which visits every facet only once. So in terms of computational complexity, this is kind of a tremendous help because right, it reduces the, the paths that you need to consider in order to find this orbit. And in fact, she managed to write down a formula to some sense for the action of this orbit. So is, it, is it every facet or? At most, I'm sorry, thank you so much, I'm sorry. It should be uh, at most, uh, yes. So yes. you could squeeze them some time as an intersection? Only of uh, co-dimensional one facets, yes. But, but not in the, s in the higher order singular strata. So there is, so K is our polytope and there is a, a certain object here which you can think about it as a simplex. So this is just a bunch of points associated with the, with the combinatorial data of the polytope K. So this is essentially a simplex. And then Pazit were able to roll down a formula for the hofford sender capacity almost completely in terms of the combinatorial data of the polytope, but there is a catch here. There is a maximum overall relabeling of the facets. So there is a maximum here over the uh, permutation group, which makes this extremal problem somehow difficult. 
But if you can find a way just to look at this formula and relate it with the volume, then you can solve Viterbo's conjecture. And I think this is a good place to stop my talk. Thank you Thank very you. much.